Hi everybody, welcome to the April 2015, wow that's hard to say, um, Houston Clutter Coaching Meetup Group. Hi everybody. Hello. Hi. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about the psychology of clutter today, the perception of value, which I think is a, um, a one of the ways that we get hung up a lot. So let me start out by saying when I'm working with clients and we're going through sort, 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 what are we going to do? I'm asking the same question over and over and over again. Is it staying? Is it going? And sometimes the answers are real easy. It's staying. That's the book that I'm currently reading. It's going. That vacuum cleaner's broken. Real easy to say, zip, zip. But sometimes it's not so easy. And this is when the mental gymnastics start. This is when people start, I can see like there's a pause when they're trying to answer that question. And then I can see the machinery starting to turn. And the worrying is happening. And they're trying to come up with the reason that they need to keep the item, right? And here are some of the reasons that I hear. And I'm, some of you guys have heard these before, right? I need to keep that. It might be worth something, I can sell it on eBay, I'm gonna have a garage sale, right? I need to keep that, it's always that first, because it costs me a lot of money. I need to keep that, because I'm gonna fix it one day, right? I need to keep that, I might need it someday. What they're really saying to me is, they want to, come up with a reason to assign value to the object. It must be valuable because I'm struggling to let go of it. Let me explain the value to you. And so sometimes I get really, really long tails about why it needs to stay. <laughs> and sometimes I get really long explanations about it was my grandmother's and yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm happy to listen to the tale because sometimes people just need to tell the story and then they can let it go. But mostly when the answer is it, yes, that can go, or uh, no, it can't, it's staying, it's because you have tapped into, I perceive that this has value, and I'm now going to explain to you why it's valuable so that you can agree with me and let me keep it. That's really what's happening, right? But I want to look at what do these statements have in common, right? We're trying to rationalize why we need to keep things. And the best thing, the best reason to keep things that we're not using, that we don't like, or that we've already replaced is, it's got value to me. It has a perceived value to me. Sometimes the perceived value is monetary. Sometimes the perceived value is usefulness. It still has use, right? Sometimes the perceived value is protection against scarcity. You keep it, it feels valuable because it feels like it keeps scarcity at bay. When your fear of running out of things is kicking in and you want to save it all in case something is happening terrible someday. So let's talk about monetary value first. Lots of clients tell me it's worth money. You have stuff from here's the antiques, here's the crystal, here's the artwork, Here's the Star Wars collectibles that I have. And it all has a value to, uh, in terms of money to someone somewhere. If you could just sell it, it'll be worth money. And so then I have people who say to me, I'm going to have a garage sale. Except that they're 70 and it's 100 degrees outside. Right? <laughs> yeah. That perception of monetary value is a big sticker for people. If they think it's worth a lot of money, they feel like they need to take that item that's worth a lot of money and translate it into cash in order to feel comfortable with letting go of it. So it's not going out of the house and still it goes through a selling process. So there's a couple of flaws with that. Um, you are not a retail store, right? So the idea that you're gonna get a retail value even in a secondary market out of it is usually um, you know a little fantasy for yourself that you're having 
Now some people take things and go to retail stores or they put it on Craigslist or they go on eBay and I do know that that kind of commerce takes place. There are things out there that you can take, spend the time to list, have somebody sell, ship it off, you got a check in the mail, you got money from PayPal, woohoo. But the truth is that not everything that you got from your grandmother is going to get you $10,000 on Antiques Roadshow, right? It's not all worth a gazillion dollars. So even for the things that are worth money, that you're willing to do the work to get the money out of, in whatever form of commerce that is going to take place for you to do it, it's still only going to be, you know, 10 pieces of something. Some of your furniture, it's going to be some tchotchkes, it's going to be some of your shoes. A lot of people tell me, you know, I'm, I'm going to resell all my clothes. Well, no, you're not. <laughs> you're going to resell a fraction of your clothes because the ones that you spent big money on that actually clothing that's holding its value is going to be a small portion of your sale. And the other 95% of your closet is not going to be worth the effort to try to resell. My point is, yes, some things have monetary value. And yes, sometimes they're worth going through the process to sell to get the money out of them. But that is not going to be the vast majority of the contents in your house. It's going to be a very select portion of high value, high dollar things in your house that are going to be worth the effort. Now, we've had this conversation about garage sales before. The, sub, the subversion of it's all worth money, I can make money from it, is I'm going to have a garage sale, right? So, um, as the clinical audience knows, <laughs> Garage sales are a lot of fun when you're 25, not so much when you're 55, right? It's a lot of work, and you do you sit it all out there, and you interact with a million people, and it's hot outside and humid, and you sell stuff, and you get some money, and then you're left with a lot of stuff at the end that you still have to process. So, if you like hanging out outside, <laughs> then, you know, go for it. But... It's one of those things that someone decides in their head, I have clients that decide, I'm going to have a garage sale. And so then we start stocking things for a garage sale that never actually takes place. And what I want you to keep in mind as you're thinking about that as an option is, do I really want to do all this work? And if I don't, then the perceived value that this is worth money is not real because I'm not really willing to do the work to make it turn into money. Does that make sense? Okay. That's money. Hi. So the other popular value we sign for our stuff is usefulness. It's a different kind of client. So I have clients that are worried about the monetary value and I have clients that are worried about the fact that it still has usefulness. This is sort of the, um, uh, the cousin to the artistic, it has potential. <laughs> Artists say everything has potential, which gives them you know, the right to save anything that even remotely is trash, because it could be art. Well, the other version is, it's still useful. And I'll grant you that it's true. There's things out in your house that probably are still useful. But the question that I always ask is, it may still have usefulness, but is it useful to you? If it's stuck in the closet, if it's buried under a bunch of stuff, if you have five of them, if the one that you're keeping is broken, it may be useful, but it's not useful to you right now. And I think that's the mistake that people make who are focused on that it still has usefulness. Just like artists cannot keep the potential of all art in their house because they're not going to make it all. <laughs> all the usefulness and all the things that you have is not going to be used by you. Right? You don't get a prize at the end if you die with a whole bunch of useful items still in your house. Oh. Yeah, sorry, Harry. <laughs> no prize. And it's really the movie prize because the person that has to come and clean out your house is going to seriously suffer for all the effort of trying to clear it out. So 
usefulness. There's a certain kind of person that, you know, these people are usually, they're worried about recycling. They're worried about not putting things in the landfill. They're trying to be responsible. They're trying to be, they're hearing their mother in their ear saying, don't waste, don't waste, don't waste, right? And I totally get it. It's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. As long as it's not causing you to be trapped and drowning in the stuff in your house. So you have to accept that there's a, you know, there's an end of the usefulness to you, even if it's not, its usefulness isn't complete, and it has to be moved on to the next person that's going to use it, right? If it's not going to just be parked in your closet forever, its usefulness trapped in time at the bottom of the closet, it has to be taken out and given a chance for somebody else to use it. And you may not get to see the end result. Sometimes for the people that are worried about being responsible to the earth, the idea of letting it go makes them nervous because they can't see that they're not guaranteed that it's 100% going to get used. And, and my only response to that is you have to trust that it will go off into the river of stuff and you know somebody else will use it. It will not happen 100% of the time. I, I realize. But... <clears throat> It's definitely not happening in your closet, right? And you are suffering for, you know, parking it in your space and letting it live there for forever. I'm just saying. Locked away in your closet means it'll never get used and that defeats the purpose of keeping it in the first place if it's just parked there forever. The last value we place on things is protection against scarcity. So, scarcity is something you learn as a kid, right? Scarcity thinking, that concept of, I never have enough, I don't have enough. So maybe your mom was a single mom, and she raised a bunch of kids on one woman's salary, and it was hard. Maybe dad lost his job, and the family went without things for a while, while he spent a year looking for a job. That kind of shift in environment is very imprinting and traumatizing for little kids, right? Like as an adult, you can recognize, I lost my job, that's really a bummer, I'm gonna go look for a job, we're gonna tighten the belt in the meantime, and it's gonna be hard. But then you also have some conception that you're gonna be okay on the other side, and you're gonna be able to move on to the next thing. So little kids, they don't know that, right? They just know that everybody's really upset, and it's very tense, and they can't have the game they want, or. They didn't get lunch today because there's not enough food, right? So you, if you have that experience as a little kid, I think it makes it harder for you as an adult to not hold things against future bad possibility, right? It makes you nervous, and so you don't want to let go of anything. I think that we have newer versions of it now. The old version of it was the depression, right? Most of those people are, you know, on the, that's a waning, dwindling population, of course. Anybody that actually was a kid when the depression was happening. But it, that was sort of a big version of everybody didn't have anything. <laughs> it was really bad for everybody. Our versions now are much more targeted and family and, you know, people that lived through Katrina, for instance. Those kinds of things where large populations are affected and shocked into panic about scarcity and loss. But I think in this time of our <coughs> lives, they're much more, you know, the house burned down. My dad lost his job. I only have a single parent. And so the, the, the tragedies are much more focused and narrow, right? The experiences are more unique. But I think that the result is the same you still have a sense of scarcity and it triggers how you collect things and how you're willing to let go of them. And I think it's, um, it's a, we'll let Beth talk about that later, she's a psychologist chick, but I think, <laughs> she's not a psychologist, but I think it's one of those things that as an adult you have to get conscious that part of your response to the stuff is that it's your little kid being afraid that you're gonna one day wake up and need that box and not have that box. And if I say it out loud like that, okay, so you're saving those boxes because you're gonna mail stuff. 
but you have 50 boxes, are you mailing 50 packages? Right? Well, I need those at Christmas time. Okay, so how many relatives do you have? Four. So you're going to mail four packages to different parts of the country. So that's the, you know, now the rest of those packages are really kind of taking up space, right? It's a little kid panic that says, I must keep all of these boxes because I might need them. I don't know what size. I don't know. And what if I don't have the right box? And then there's this panic look on their face. Okay, but think about that as an adult for a minute. You'll just ask one of your friends for a box. Just go buy a box at the store. You'll go to the liquor store and say, give me a box, right? It isn't that anything really super terrible is gonna happen, but it's that we get sort of hung up on the panic and then we don't go the rest of the way and talk ourselves down from the panic, right? <clears throat> The problem with holding all things against any potential bad, and we've had this problem before, if you're holding everything against a whole host of unknown potential problems to solve, dramas that might happen, whatever, you end up, because you don't know which one of those potentials is going to come to pass, you end up keeping a whole bunch of stuff against a whole bunch of possibilities, and then when this one happens, you don't know where the thing is that goes with this one because it's buried in the sea of potential, right? I recognize that it is, a, it is a level of comfort for people to save a whole bunch of stuff against a whole bunch of eventualities. They want to be able to go, see, I was ready for that one. Look, here's my 57 pencils, right? <laughs> <laughs> but if, if the result of that is that you have to live in a really, really crowded space that requires a lot of management, a lot of putting things away, a lot of storage and categorizing, and you are, A, spending a whole bunch of your time managing the stuff, constantly having to put stuff away, having to unpack to find, having to, you know, if you're real organized about it, it means you spend a whole lot of time managing it. And if you're not really organized about it, it means that you're sort of wading through a sea of stuff. But either way, there's scope creep. You, you lose, you surrender living space in the house, and you surrender management time to an ever-growing protection against possibility. So that value really ends up costing you something on the back end, right? The value is you're prepared for all eventuality. The cost is you don't have all the space you need in your house and you're spending all your time protecting your, you know, collection of things that might be useful someday. Right? Again, when you're 25, you know, the collection's not that big. When you're 55, the collection's much bigger. And there's a whole lot more work to do and you have a whole lot less energy and willingness to do it. And you'd much rather be having a margarita than in there sorting the boxes, right? So it's, from my point of view, looking into your house, it is a misperception of value. There's some little trains in there of all of the sea of stuff. You know, these three things might be worth selling. Yeah, you might want to take that stuff to a resale store. Yeah, you might want to, you know, save this stuff against because you guys go, well, here's an example. Tammy has a husband and three boys. They're all, they, they did Boy Scouts up till forever. So they have like a whole closet full of camping gear. Now, this would not happen in my house because <laughs> sister is not camping. <laughs> the boys are adults and yet they also go camping with their dad. So the gear is still active. It's not just parked in the closet with nothing going on. They're still pulling it out and going out, and I can't imagine why, but they're still going out and using the gear. So having a full closet full of all the camping gear makes sense, right? The other thing that you have a whole lot of stuff is school supplies for boys who are no longer in school. So we have that discussion a lot, <laughs> and so far I'm losing. But it's organized. It just takes up a lot of space, right? And we're, you know, always putting things back into the stash, and it's a real big stash. 
So the latest sale for that one is she's prepared for her grandkids. <laughs> she doesn't have any yet, but they're coming, right? So, okay. Like I said, it's organized, it has cabinets, it's all in boxes, it's all in there, and it's, it has a place. But it takes a lot of time to manage, is the point. It's, she's on the end where it's all organized, there's just a lot of it, and so it takes a lot of time. And, you know, she works, and I know you don't want to spend all your time doing that. So we keep having that discussion. In the end, I want you guys to be able to say, okay, yes, maybe it has value. Maybe it has monetary value, and I'm willing to sell it because if I sell it, I'm going to get 100 bucks. And 100 bucks is worth three hours of my time. I'm willing to do three hours worth of work to make that thing go away and get money out of it. But that's worth $5, and I'm not willing to work for three hours in order to get $5, right? It's not worth it. And I want you guys to be able to think about, okay, is it, I know I think it has value, but is that value worth the time for me to make that value happen? Mon monetary and useful and, you know, protection against possibility. We sort of reflexively say, when I'm having that conversation, is it staying? Is it going? Yes, I'm gonna sell. I'm gonna sell that in the garage sale. And then they keep going. That like that's they're done. It's like yeah, no, we have to talk about that. <laughs> We're not done with that one because it is a question. Like that's the default. Here is my legitimate reason to keep it. I'm gonna sell it in the garage sale. And then you stop thinking and you put it aside and you keep going. And I want you to arrest yourself in that place and go, so I'm telling Gil <laughs> that I'm going to keep it for the garage sale. But am I really going to have a garage sale? Like, do I really want to be out in the heat right now selling stuff? No. Do I really have, do I want to spend my Saturday going to the resale shop so I can get it in the resale shop? Do I want to spend two hours on the computer listing it in Craigslist or listing it on eBay and then driving to the post office to ship it away. Maybe that doesn't sound like fun. Maybe I don't really want to do that. And so maybe, you know, off it goes. I think in the end, we stop at the easy point, which is, oh, good, I came up with a reason to keep it. Awesome. Now I don't have to have any hard decisions. Mm. And you have to take the next step beyond that and say, Okay, I get it that it has value, but is that value costing me something on the back end? And I'd rather it not anymore, and I'm going to let Gail take it away. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, so I want to let you guys tell me your experiences of value that hang you up. How is it that you talk yourself into keeping it, and then you're sorry that you kept it later? Yes, ma'am. Um, I do that a lot with paper, and I think that it might be, have, I think there's a reason to have it, and probably I haven't read what it is, like a letter or something, but I think I might do something or, or remind me of an event or something. Oh, I you said buy. a whole bunch of things in there. Yeah. Okay, so reminding you of an event. So this is a, this is a person who... This is a generic, I'm not talking specifically about you. <laughs> She's saying it's, uh, the piece of paper reminds her of the event. So that's the to-do list or the event reminder by paper laying around the house. Some people use that as a visual trigger to remember things. Or that's what I mean. Hmm? Or a memory. Or a memory. So you're using that piece of paper to remind you to do something, to remind you to make a phone call, to remind you to follow up. <coughs> Or this is my, you know, this is my keepsake, right? If you're using loose pieces of paper as your, you know, event planner, as your day timer, um, it's a natural incl inclination for people that are visually triggered, but it's also sort of a recipe for disaster because they float around the house, right? Like you just wait for it to come to the top of the stack again to remind you again, right? So you don't ever actually do the thing in a timely manner. 
you just get reminded that you missed it the next time you pick it up, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the time comes to the top, the minutes pass. Yeah, whoops. <laughs> Darn, right? So it is a quick and easy default way to manage your to-dos, but not a very successful one. <laughs> and it requires some intervention for people who are really visually stimulated. It requires some adaptation for keeping all those things in one place, you know, putting some effort against your grain to make lists, to keep them on calendars, to park them in one place, to flip the stack every once in a while. Yeah. You know, it requires some intervention that is sort of contra, you know, against your natural inclination. And so it does require work. Um, the other thing about paper is that this is and this is something that Ed said to me once. You find the less you understand the pieces of paper, the more you feel like you need to keep them, right? Mm -hmm. So when you have the piece of paper from the insurance company, the doctor's office bill, uh, you know, here comes somebody sending you a letter of notice, and you read it and you like, this is Greek, I don't understand what they're saying to me, it must be important. Mm -hmm. This is our mental default to, I'm too stupid to understand what the paper says, therefore it must be really valuable. And let me just tell you, no, <laughs> that's not true. But there is some basic papers that you can learn to recognize and understand the value about. And it's re that's really just an education that you need to have about, here's what explanation benefits are. They come from the insurance company in order to tell you how they're handling your bill. They're required legally to say, this doctor submitted a claim for you for this date and this amount. We paid it, thanks. As long as you agree with what they did, you don't need it anymore, you're done. As long as the doctor really got paid, one presumes when they send the EOB out that says they paid the doctor, the doctor really got paid. But that piece of paper makes people nervous because it's coming from the insurance company, it must be important. But what they're really doing is telling you how they're handling your business on your behalf which is why you pay insurance premiums. So they'll handle your business. They report to you, I paid that bill, or I didn't pay this bill because, and then there's 47 reasons why they didn't pay the bill. Those are the ones you look at and you go, I don't agree with you, I think that my policy should cover this, and that's when you call somebody and say, I have a problem. But 99% of the time, you're gonna look at the EOB and go, no big deal. They paid the bill, thank you so much. Zzz. That's my sound for shred it. <laughs> bank statements. You know what bank statements are, investment statements. One of the things that people that have, you have investments, and then you get all of the um, prospectus, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. They come in the mail until you put them on email. <laughs> but they come in the mail, and they're basically, we're required by law and the SEC to tell you about this product that you want to buy or you're thinking about buying or the fund invested in or whatever. And once a year, we have to send you this and tell you this is what you own. Thank you, I can't understand it, goodbye. Right? They get filed because you think it's important. And you know, if you're a financial guy, you can read those things and make sense of them. But if you are not your financial advisor, then, you know, yeah, I'm going to guess that you don't really want to learn how to read them and you're not going to pay any attention to them and you can throw them away, right? So there's types of paper that you have to learn. This is what that looks like. This is what this looks like. Oh, the action I can take with this is, right? Once you learn those generic things, then you're kind of done. And you just have to get, you just have to get the training about what paper is good and what paper is easily tossed. Now she has a business as well, so she has the added caveat that she's got to keep paperwork that's related to her business. So, did I spend money in my business? Then I got to keep that paper. Did I make money in that business? Then I got to keep the paper that's evidence of that money that I spent, that I made, right? So there's some rules about paperwork to support the business. Because you know, the IRS wants to know. And they're kind of rude about it. So. That's the paper version of, it must be valuable. <laughs> I need to keep it, but in reality, no you don't. Right? Or only for a period of time. Only for a period of time, sometimes, yeah. Yes, sir. 
Um, I have issues with paper too, but my issue with paper is more magazines. That's my big one. Yeah, I, I love reading them. I've got books and stuff like that. And I've got those under control, I believe. But the magazines, I have trouble with because I always find something of value, an article or something, uh, that is going to be useful or is useful, and I put it aside to read it. Now, like with the stuff when you actually need it and don't know where it is, I may come across a situation where I need that article, but I don't know where it is. Who knows where it is, right? Okay. Uh, and you haven't read it yet. And I haven't read it yet right, because okay. I put it aside because I knew it was going to probably need it you know, next week, next month, at the end of the year. Yeah. So um, <laughs> that's a big issue for me and that I see value in these in information. And the information. I see a lot of value in information. I guess that's yes, it. Yes, yes. And um, sometimes I'll say, well, I won't keep the whole magazine. I'll just tear out the article that I need. Stage but one then, of magazine decompression. Tear out the <laughs> article. <laughs> yeah. But then I have to take into consideration the amount of time it takes me to tear it up, uh -huh. dispose of the part that I don't want, then what am I going to do with the article? Then you have a new piece of paper floating around the house, right? <laughs> exactly. So that, that's, that's, that's kind of my challenge. Okay, so I have some questions. So do you subscribe to a bunch of magazines? Uh, no, I've actually cut down the number of subscriptions. 5, 10, 3, 20? Well, I probably have about 4, 5, 6. Uh, you know, a lot of the magazines come to my office, but I don't take them home. But there's a few are, so are the magazines business related or are they personal? No, no, no. They're, they're, they're things from, uh, you know, Texas Monthly may have an interesting article about politics in Texas. Or, or you know, it could be a variety of different things. Uh, there could be an interesting article on, you know, on weight loss tips or... Uh, so it's, it's a whole variety of things. Sometimes it's one on, on cars, uh, which you know, right. like the car magazine, it's a right. review of a particular model of vehicle I'm thinking about buying, uh, not this year, but two years later, <laughs> when, when I could buy it and use. <laughs> usually I, like to, I, I rarely buy new cars now. I usually buy it when they're a couple of years old or two or three years old. I appreciate well, so one of the things that he's describing so. is that He's taking that information and using it as part of his decision-making process, mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And some of the reading is entertainment, mm -hmm. right? right? And some of it is information for your business, yes. clients. Yes. Some of it's client-related and some of it is running the business-related, right? Yes. So he's gathering data from the written form to work in his business and his life, right? He even brings life. articles to me to read that he hasn't read yet. That will be good for us. He's also <laughs> managing his wife's reading. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, cool. <laughs> so here's the thing about making paper stay paper. Okay. If you are not very good at managing it, you will never find that information again. Mm -hmm. Or it will float to the pile when the client has long since been out of your office, when the you know, taxes were already filed, when it will become... The challenge is to match you know, when you find it to when you need it, right? And that requires data management. Now, we data manage electronically now with computers, with Outlook with Google, right? We keep up with data electronically so that we don't have to keep a box with files in it, right? If you are paper happy, if that's your preferred, you know, you like holding the paper, you like reading it, then it requires that you go back to old school data management. If you want to be able to find it again, you got to be able to put it in a file. You got to have a collection of articles. These are, you know, your big categories. This is for my business. This is for my clients. This is for my personal house. Health. This is for these are shopping, you know, that kind of stuff. You don't want car XYZ file and the weight loss file because then you will have 137 files and you will still not be able to find the article, <laughs> right? You want articles that for my clients so that when your client's sitting there, you pull that file out and you flip through the you know 20 articles in there until you find the one that you saved for them. 
But I do challenge you in that regard to think, I'm a doctor, I get paid a lot of money, my hourly wage is worth a lot. I have this much free time and a two-year-old child. How much time do I want to spend managing data? And so you're trading out as you're evaluating those articles. You don't want to pick and rip and file every article that remotely looks interesting, right? You want to funnel that down to stuff that really, really, really is worth your time. So A, make a smaller collection of articles that you rip. B, have a place near you that you can park them in large categories. So that when you want it, you can go spend three minutes flipping through the file and, and put your hands back on it. Or C, bail on ripping magazines altogether and go Google that shit when you want it. <laughs> That's my wife's solution. Just throw them all in the recycle and then when you need the information, it's It's recycled. In the, in the well, and, you know, people do have preference for holding, you know, like there's a, if you're kinesthetic, holding the paper and touching it and reading it, it's all part of your ability to learn, right? So some people find, man, my mother used the paper calendar, she hated everything electronic, and for her, at writing, the, writing on the calendar on the wall helped her remember things and it helped it, it worked better for her. So if that's who you are, then you just have to use old school versions of management. But what I'm trying to say to you is I'm not selling you on, okay, now I have released you to rip every magazine article you want, go make a file, go put it in, no. Because you don't have that kind of time, I know that right now. So you have to think of your magazine ripping and filing time as very precious and valuable, and you only do it for stuff that's really worth the effort. Okay? And then have a system that's easy for you to file in. Because probably you're going to rip 20 articles for clients, and you'll probably give out three of them. Right? Mm -hmm. You'll pull them out, and you'll see it, and it'll be a good idea, and then three of them will be, make sense, and you'll hand them out. Yeah. That and filter. Yes, ma'am. What would be examples of those large categories? Oh, well, for him, Other. I think, um, you know, things that he's going to give to clients. Mm -hmm. So that covers a whole bunch of articles related to the business that he does. Right. Then, um, One for future purchases. Yeah, like he yeah, likes to think about purchases. and contemplate purchases. So anything that he's going to think about for two years before he buys, exactly. rip it out and go stick it in there. So that when the, when the buying decision comes up, he goes to the shopping file and pulls out whatever he saved over the last two years related to that object. Um, wife, <laughs> if that's a category for Shannon, right? So if he wants things for her to read, then he needs to have a place to park them. Um, the idea being that you don't want a whole bunch of file folders with one article in them, right? You want a really big category so you can pull one folder out and flip 20 pieces of paper to find the one you're looking for. But what if, you're, what if you're a big Dr. Oz fan and it's just information overload? Dr. Oz has a website. You should yeah. never print out his stuff. Isn't that the truth? Because they are, you know, you're right. He's information overload. He's going to send you emails. Anything that you want, you can go search on his website and find. Let him, he has a whole staff in charge of populating that database. Let them do it. I guess that wasn't a good example. But I knew it was information overload. Oh, well, yeah. I, I mean... I have articles on health and physical fitness, and but that could probably all be found under his website. Absolutely. And you know, when you need it, you go search, poof, here comes the article. Or one that's more current on the same topic. Yeah. And Truthfully, that's the other problem that's, that's true about paper, right? It starts aging the minute you rip it out of the magazine. Like as soon as they print it, the world moves on, and that data may or may not stay current, right? So the stuff that you keep, you want it to be, you know, have some shelf life. <coughs> if it's a list of favorite restaurants in 2010, it's not really going to do you any good anymore, right? <laughs> <coughs> Who else? You guys are quiet today. I think this is, you know, I struggle with my clients every day. This is the basis of what we're, you know, I'm saying is this thing or is this going. And this concept of... All of my things have value. They all, I spent money on them all. They're all important to me. I inherited them all, whatever. And I have this conversation with people all day long, every day. Yes? 
What about like <clears throat> the box of stuff that you've moved with you, you know, for years and but you haven't really opened, but you have it because you something. keep moving, right? Yeah. Because you have it because well we have a lot of boxes <laughs> like that. <laughs> which I don't know exactly even what's in them, but we packed it and moved it and and here you are. Yeah. So how many of you guys have been in that position, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, everybody raise their hand. Let me just say that. <laughs> so this is... If you haven't seen it in five years, you don't need it. Well, right? So the problem with that is um, if, if you're the average person, you pack like a hurricane, right? So it's like, boom, into the box. So God only knows what went into that box with the stuff that you don't really care about. So I don't like to advocate unopened boxes being thrown out because you might throw away your birth certificate, right. you know, something stupid like that. But it is a right population for, it's been marinating a long time <laughs> and, and uh, you know, the charge of ownership has slipped and it's usually a high population of things that's easy to get rid of. So if you're starting an organizing project, it's a good place to start because there's, you know, Sometimes when it's you haven't been looking at it for a long time, it stops seeming important. And you pack in a hurry and you throw a bunch of garbage and you may open the box and go, what in the hell is in here? And why is it still here? Because it's, you know, it was the last minute stuff that went in and half of it was trash. Or it was mail that you were going to open when you got on the other end and you forgot about it and now it's in there and it can be thrown out, you know. You'll never know what you find in there. And it's usually never a full box. When I unpack those boxes, they've been move, 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 move. They're never full. Yes, ma'am. Um, I've probably brought this up before, but it's something that I continue to struggle with, and that is um, I go and I, I get things that I like better than the existing things I have. But then I'm, uh, I'm overwhelmed with finding a place for it and then having the time and energy to go through the existing things and then the question of value comes up. And, you know, I think we can all be very good about rationalizing things, you know, and, and then it's kind of a, it's stalled. Mm -hmm. So the newer things I like better, sometimes they're in bags and not being used because I don't have Place Cause you haven't figured out what that. to do with yeah. them, right? So that's a struggle for me. Yeah. Well, and I think this is this is the outgrowth of this is the outgrowth of you liking to shop, shop, right? <laughs> so you do like to shop, and you find things you like better, and then you don't replace what's at home. You just add. Not at the same rate. Yes. Yeah. 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 And so it doesn't. Then you you end up drowning and not being able to put it all away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, we have talked about. That. And and that's common, right? Like it's so much easier to add than it is to attract. It's so much easier to go buy, wander through the store, and go, oh, that's cute, look, and come home with more stuff, and then not have the room to put it away. I have been donating some things, and I, I do take some things to resale shops. Um, but one of the things that you're saying to me is that you, you get into the, but the it projects, feels it all feels valuable to you at yeah. this point because yeah. you it's all from shopping, uh -huh. and you are. Um, getting hung up on I can't get rid of it because I spent money on it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But you spent money on the new stuff too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's got that. I need to come to your house. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, the bottom line is uh, it is all valuable and you did spend money for it all. And you can't keep it all. It doesn't fit. Like I said, I have donated some things. I have taken some things to resale shops. Those things are clearer for me to make a decision about. But then there's right. a third category. Mm, yeah. Mm. Like I said, that's kind of stalled. Yeah. And it's harder for me to make a decision on. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit more because afterwards, because I want to explore that at greater length and I think it's going to take a minute. Yeah. The bottom line is, still, you have to be able to let go and you have to figure out what keeps you from letting go and what makes it okay for you to let it go. Okay, you've been waiting so patiently. Yes, ma'am. Well, I, I just, I, I kind of, I struggle with um, my collection, my 
collections, not as in fancy or expensive, but volume collections <laughs> of clothing. <coughs> I love them. I love them. <coughs> and and also things from your mom. And you can you can you can pat me along on this. I have in the trunk of my car probably twenty plus pairs of just slacks that I have taken to a resale. They didn't sell. I've carried them around, had a couple people fleece some, and it's down to like 20-something now. <laughs> They've been in my car for two and a half months. I can't let that go. And, and one thing I wanted to share, and it's not about clothes, I still need to do this, but I have some collectibles, some delicate things that every time I go to Dustin, I'm like, I'm going to break them, and then it's not worth anything, right? Not that it's worth, it's just worth something to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it probably costs a few hundred dollars. Not that it's going to sell or I'm going to sell. So anyways, the, the, what I wanted to share with y'all is I thought, you know, I bought a couple things off of eBay recently. Not collectibles, but something else. Let me see how much that Yadro is worth today, right? The same one that's been retired, there's like 30 on eBay for sale. So I'm not a retail store. That was an epiphany for me to go, wow, you know. Even if I think I could sell it and get it, you know, I need to let it go. It took the value up Away. to reduce the value yeah. for me last night on that one thing by looking at it and going, there's 30 of them out there and they're not selling and nobody's yeah. buying and yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I mean, it, we always have a kind of an inflated perception of the value of our stuff. Uh -huh. And I always tell people, <laughs> imagine if you were standing at the garage sale looking at your stuff. If your stuff was in somebody else's garage sale and you were trying to buy it, what value would you see it then? When it's not yours, yeah. it's always worth a dollar. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when it's yours, it's worth 50, but when you're the person buying, it's only worth a buck, right? So I do wanna add on the garage sale example. So I remember probably 15 years ago, my roommate and I at the time did a garage sale down in Montrose and we had tons of clothes and we spent two days Getting, with yeah. price tags, $2, $5, $10 on every piece of clothing. And I remember my boyfriend came by and said, if you just sell every one of those pieces of clothing for $1, between the two of y'all, y'all have generated like $300. I mean, oh no. So in the end, we had all these clothes left over because it was too much value. So I, again, the garage sale, that's a good example. You have a garage sale driving around in your trunk. Yeah, right now, yeah. and they're worth fifty cents a piece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, I I needed this. I needed to find you and uh, different organizing better because I have a storage that I pay one hundred and thirty dollars. I've had it for a year, and I do not know what's in there. I just know it's valuable to me, or at least I thought. And I'm like every month I'm spending one hundred and thirty dollars. And the gold, I will shop you with $130. Okay, so you months, so hire it's her. A lot. You know what the math is. We've done this in here before, right? Yeah. $130 times 12 months. It's a lot. A lot of money, right? And you can replace the stuff that, that you have bought like five times over for that rent, right? And it comes from like my mom and my dad. They have to keep everything. Yeah. Like there's it is not worth paying rent to continue to own things you already bought. But my house is still a bunch of stuff. And I do like to organize, like I help organize and stuff. And I like everything to be like in order. But because I'm so focused on one thing, everything else is like flipping upside down. Right. So that's my thing. So you have the you hyper focus on one. And every single year I spend like a whole week. And I have people cleaning and organizing with me, building these shelves and everything. I'm like, that's a lot of money. So this is what I'm making. You know, I need to listen to people that are going to put cents on my head. And, and that's what I'm doing. And I found, you know, because, because you can only organize it so much, right? Yes. And then it, the house is still a box that has finite walls and you can't do anything about it. It, can't, does, it can only hold up to a point and then you're, you're at capacity. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Can I give a crazy idea that's kind of fun to get rid of all your things? Go for it. Um, I run some meetups as well, and so I have access to a lot of people. And um, one of my meetups, I said, okay, we're going to have a Trader's Village. Um, they have bands out there, so we have a Trader Village event. So what happened was I went out there and I grabbed the booth. These things cost about, I can't remember, $25 or $35, right? I don't really 
want to try to sell thirty five dollars. Maybe it's been fifty dollars. You have to get there early. So everybody else who came late, I charged them a tax because they didn't have to pay the fifty bucks to get the food, right? So then we had a band. We were out there the entire day, and I don't have enough to really fill on these boots. So everybody just kind of piled their things in, huh. and I I made some like three hundred bucks, wow. okay. And then all the other people, they were there still, but they partied quite a bit, and then they made about hundred bucks a piece. So it's, it's an easy way, it's kind of fun. You just gotta get a whole bunch of people to go to traders there and just say, let's, let's And have a, have a party. Have a party. But so see, yeah. what he did there was, A, he made it fun, and B, he didn't worry about how much money he made. He spent the whole day there. Yeah. But, you know, $300 for the whole day, okay. not really good, you know, not a good return, return on investment, yeah. but he sort of, he had fun for his full day. And music and entertainment, and so you know he got some value out of it another way. Part of it was hanging with people and you know being entertained. So yeah, if that makes it more fun for you, I think that's a great idea. Because you know it, it has to be fun to to make it easier, right? Like it was an easy way for you to do it. Yeah. Everybody else just drove up in their car and stopped and they loaded in the same booth. Yeah. I had so how much was left? <laughs> Oh, I got rid of everything I wanted to get rid of. That's good. Yeah, anyway. Awesome. I didn't bring anything back. <laughs> awesome. There you go. Yes, sir. I have two things. One, uh, a lot of things you can, as far as clothes go, if you just need to get rid of them, you can give them to like the turning point and places like that to improve better women. Mm -hmm. they, they're it's glad, true. They gladly take things like that. The other thing is the comment I wanted to make was my brother's had a store ship for, for 30 years. Two of them. And, and uh, so don't get yourself in that trap. <laughs> well, exactly, right? And I've had clients who three, four storage units are paying fees all over the place just to keep not going through the stuff. Yeah. Like part of it, you're paying to not go through the stuff. Well, my brother doesn't even live in the state. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Oh. <laughs> And you watch those shows, right? Like they go in and they buy the unit because they're not paying the rent anymore and they, somebody buys a unit and they go in there and they grab the stuff and they're flinging it all out, right? Because they're looking for the two things in there that are worth money, right? They're looking for the three collectibles that they can resell and make their money back and make a profit and the rest of it's all going out in the trash, right? And that poor person has spent years Stop, stop now. <laughs> no. No, we're having a neighborhood garage sale. Everybody goes to the front of the neighborhood. They announce it everywhere. And it's May the 2nd, next week. So I have a week to go through that garage and just like, I'm going to put it in my truck and I take it out of there. And I told my husband, after the garage sale, whatever, it's not coming back home because I have to drive to the front of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I'm like, if you're not coming home, I'm not even going to. Yay! Don't let it. You want, and you know there may be one or two things in there that's from your parents that you really care about, but the truth is, the, all the rest of it's not happening. And I see she did the flag so good. I'm so glad. That is the times up for tonight. So thank you very much for coming, and we'll see you next month.